everybody and welcome to the shed where basically we just play around with stuff that I think is well interesting. So when it comes to controlling heat in appliances there are in fact only three strategies. The first one is do nothing at all, the second one is stick a switch in there and the third one is use a controller. Each one's applicable to different circumstances. If you've got something that's pretty basic really and not a very high temperature there's actually nothing you need to do with it. The second one is for kind of mid-range things, things like your kettle and your iron and your oven. In that case you're basically putting a switch in it. And the third one is kind of where you need much more control so you're looking at things like furnaces and better controlled industrial ovens, that sort of thing. Now the first one I can need to explain a bit more about what I mean by it and for that we need Ohm's law. Ohm's law is V equals IR and what it means is that at a given voltage with a given resistance a given current will flow. The reason for that is current only flows if it can overcome a resistance and voltage is like the push needed to overcome that resistance. Of course as the current flows through a resistance it offers resistance and it heats up. That's exactly how heating appliances work. Well, heating appliances of this kind. Let's take a circuit made up of a battery, some copper wire and a bit of nichrome wire. When the electrons flow through the circuit the copper wire hardly heats at all, but the nichrome wire gets red hot. To understand this we need to compare the structure of the materials. If we have a look at the copper wire it's composed of a network of ions that are free to vibrate but not move and there's a sea of disassociated electrons that are free to move through the copper wire. As they move through the copper wire there's very little getting in their way. Every now and then they'll hit one of the copper ions and make it vibrate a little bit more but on the whole they're relatively free to flow through the copper wire. If we look at the nichrome it's an alloy of nickel, chromium and iron. It has a network of three different ions but the number of electrons that are free to flow are lower because some of the electrons are taken up in bonding. The bonds also restrict the number of pathways available for the free movement of electrons. So when the current is turned on the electrons in copper flow easily and don't often collide with the vibrating ions. In nichrome the electrons can't move ahead easily because they are resisted by the bonds and they more often hit the vibrating ions causing more vibration. And this vibration is what we see as heat. So that is fundamental to understanding what do nothing at all means. Now it's true that Ohm's law only really applies to direct current. Now it will apply to alternating current but alternating current only under a resisted load. Under an inductive load different rules apply but as resistance heating is a resistance load or dual heating is another reference to it then we can use Ohm's law in the same way for AC that we can for DC. Now if we look at it then if we want to heat something we want a certain amount of current to flow. The more current that flows the quicker and hotter it will get because it's not heating in isolation, it's actually heating in an ambient. That heat it's generating is being given off at a rate and the rate of it heating up and the rate of it giving off will mean that it reaches a fixed temperature within a few bits of fluctuation where it generates the same amount of heat as it's giving off and so it reaches a temperature and you can do that if you have a fixed voltage. If you have a fixed voltage say 12 volts and you paint a radiator when you've got a 10 ohm resistance then the current is known and in this case of course 1.2 amps will flow that will create a resistance creating heat and it will get to some temperature and you can just measure that temperature. If that temperature is too much for the voltage that you've got well you just increase the resistance and of course the current will drop and the temperature will drop. So you can control it just by using V equals IR 
Of course, you need a little bit of experimentation to find out where that level is for the voltage for the material you're using. But once you've got that, it's always going to be the same. Now, there is a mild effect of temperature on conductivity. It changes it. But at low temperatures, then the change is pretty insignificant and not really going to impact very much on this. What's going to impact on is the use that you put it to. So, for example, if you're using that as a pet bed, then the pet is going to be sitting there with their own heat covering that. And, of course, the heat that it's going to give off can't escape anywhere. And so the overall temperature will go up because you have effectively insulated it. And that will only work when it's in the ambient. If you're going to insulate it, you're going to sit a pet on it, then of course you need that temperature to be very much lower. So you don't want to be making a pet bed that's going to heat up to 40 degrees centigrade. If you're then going to sit a pet on it, you want 8, 9, 10 degrees centigrade, something like that. Just something that takes the chill off the bed so the pet is warm and comfortable. Now, of course, that may not be acceptable to you because you may worry about it overheating. In which case, what you want to do is the same thing that you do with cookers, and that is put a switch in it. And the switch is, in fact, always the same. It's a bimetallic switch. If you take your cooker apart, what you'll see is a knob with an adjustable handle where you can change a spring tension. But a bimetallic strip is made out of a strip of two metals that bend differently when they're heated. When they're heat, they bend open. And when they're closed, they bend shut. And you can either get it in a dial configuration or get it in a small tablet configuration where the amount of bend to open or close a switch is fixed by the manufacturer and that temperature is printed on the case. That can just be put in line with your positive supply from your DC or your live and it will automatically switch off when it reaches that temperature or switch on when it falls below that temperature. Of course, you need that switch in a position where it is a mid-temperature, but it is just a bimetallic strip breaking the positive that switches off and on. And that's a very common thing to find in things like pet blankets, and you certainly find it in your household cooker. The third way is the way that's a bit more complicated because for this, what you need is a microcontroller, a way of turning high current off and on, and a way of sensing that current. But they actually come as kits, and they're called PID controllers. It's about £20 or so. It's a preset box where you screw in a K-type thermocouple, you put that into the area where you want to sense the temperature, and it goes to a silicon-controlled switch that will turn the high power off and on. Now, with those three strategies, you actually have all you need to control the heat of any heat application ranging from a foot warmer right the way through to an industrial pottery kiln. Luke took an exercise machine and made a generator out of it. Okay, so in my view, Luke did an awesome job with this, actually. I mean, he got about 60, 70 watts out of it, which is not far from the GN44. The GM44 was a military issue field generator that was used with their radio. And during the D Day landings, they had something like 50,000 of these units being lugged around the beach by the soldiers. Now, I look at historical reconstructions of these things, or even the original historical devices, there have been some beautiful machines made. In fact, even right from Faraday's first generator experiment, where all he really did was make up a coil, have a bar magnet and push that bar magnet in and out, connected to a galvanometer. There are just some wonderful constructions in mahogany and brass and steel and copper that are things in themselves worth having. Now, I look at the GN44 and think that it's a beautiful thing. In my eyes, it is a beautiful thing. It's robustly made. It was meant to withstand abuse. It would produce about 70 watts or so with two voltage supplies. What a thing! And it was basically only really three components. There was the generator, which was actually a kind of alternator, actually. It was uh, an alternator made in the same way as this, attached to a gearbox, so that when you could use your arm strength, you could gear it up. And then, of course, voltage regulation and output. That's all it was. And it was set at a height that you could comfortably sit at and use both hands to be able to turn it. So one soldier turned it and the other one operated the radio. The way it worked was pretty straightforward. The generator section itself comprises of a rotor, 
two field windings and a pair of brushed commutators. The field windings function as electromagnets. When the mechanism begins to turn, residual magnetism induces a current in the rotor. Some of this current flows through the field windings, which generate a sustained magnetic field as the rotor continues to turn. As the rotor turns, an alternating electric current is induced in the windings, and this is where the commutators become important. On either side of the commutator rings are sets of carbon electrodes called brushes. The brushes change the polarity of the current from the rotor depending on its position. So current flows in only one direction once it leaves the rotor. They are mechanical diodes. The two sets of commutators in this generator conduct two sets of voltages. A 6 volt supply for the transmitter filament and a 500 volt supply for the transmitter plates. The generator has a filter system, which is just a collection of passive components, which smooth out the rough signal produced by the mechanical components of the generator. It consists of a choke and a capacitor, an electrolytic capacitor on the low voltage side and a large paper cap on the high voltage side. The final part is the voltage regulator. It's an electromechanical regulator, which is essentially just a relay. It implements a closed-loop voltage regulator using only mechanical parts and electromagnetism. When the signal from the low-voltage commutator exceeds an adjustable threshold, a coil in the regulator pulls this reed switch away from the normally closed position. In this state, a resistor is connected in series with the generator field coils, which works to dampen the whole system. If this doesn't do enough to reduce the output voltage, the reed will continue to move across the gap until it contacts the other side, which shorts out the field winding, and effectively turns off the generator for an instant. Because of the negative feedback provided for by this system, the output voltage of the machine remains approximately constant, even if the user turns the crank too quickly. So what I thought I'd do is in the spirit of the uh, GN44, remake this, but in the same way that a US Army field generator was made. So we've got to take this and we've got to chop a few bits off and weld a few more bits on. Okay, now we've got it freestanding and standing upright. I need a couple of handles and to do that, I'm going to cut off this pedal to this. Okay, so that's it. That's the uh, mechanicals of my attempt to replicate in modern materials the wartime generator. Now, it is actually surprisingly comfortable to generate, so we could do that really quite easily all day long. It's nice. We could obviously run this from uh, the alternator in the same way that Luke did with the belt on this drive here. But Luke's already done that, so why waste an opportunity to do something different, hey? So I'm going to do another part to this where I'm going to actually make the flywheel the generator as opposed to putting uh, an alternator on it. But we could just put an alternator on it. The other thing, obviously, is we could put a seat on it. Now, <laughs> I'm quite short, so I have to get kind of near to it. And of course, there are people a lot longer, so that seat would have to be either adjustable or freestanding, but as you can see, you can sit quite happily on the floor. But a little stool would probably would be pretty brilliant as well. Anyway, that is the mechanical side of it, all done and dusted and really didn't take very long. And we'll put the electrical side on in another video. But that's absolutely beautiful. I'm also loving the grey look of it, this sort of back. Now we've got to put the generation section on it, and we have a number of choices here. One thing is we can do exactly what Luke did, and that is strap on an alternator and run it from the belt off of here, which is a really good way of doing it, but uh, I do tend to uh, favour other alternatives, because we've got this great big flywheel right here. And we can make that flywheel into the generator, as well as we could strap a generator on. But Missing out that belt, of course, what we're doing is getting a more efficient machine because we don't have the losses in transmission that we would have through a belt drive. A belt drive does lose uh, a 
energy. It loses energy through friction, that kind of thing. And if we make this flywheel directly into the generator, of course, we don't have those losses. Now, in order to do that, we have done this in previous videos before. Remember, generation is just about having a magnetic field moving surrounded by coils and then the generation will be the speed at which it moves, the strength of the magnetic field and the number of turns of wire in that coil being those three factors. So we can turn this into a generator by sticking a lot of magnets on the outside of there and because we've got this that turns really quite quickly so even for a slow hand speed here we get a quick speed at this flywheel which is great having all those things that we want and what I've got for that is this it's a whole bunch of neodymium magnets again working on field strength because I could put ceramics on there or I could put these on there these are a load of neodymium magnets and they will just fasten like that and be glued on super glue is fine because this is a bit of steel and the super glue is just going to assist the attraction of the magnets onto that steel so my job super glue a load of magnets onto the outside of here these are one centimeter by 30 centimeters by three millimeters to be honest it's actually quite astonishing how easy this is because i've glued these magnets on with the super glue north south north south and then i've stuck this coil here this coil is from a microwave oven fan lots of little turns and i've glued it on with some fiberglass resin and all i did was stick a piece of cardboard between those two, squeeze the resin in there and let it set. And then when I pull that out, we have ourselves a generator. Now I've put one coil on it to test it. So we can give that a spin. Makes a nice noise, doesn't it? And we'll see what we get out of here. There we go, lighting that light, absolutely no problem at all. Now, it's producing about 12 watts or so for a single coil. So if I want 120 watts, I put 10 coils around and there and connect them in series of parallel, depending on the voltage that I want. Now, given that the uh, army field generator is only about 80 watts and you've got about 60 watts per arm in your arm strength, 100 watts, it's going to be about what you can get out of such a thing. If you put more coils on than those 10 coils, you're probably going to find you can't actually turn it. But... All I've got to do now is add those other coils and put on a voltage regulation, just like we've done in previous videos. But there we go. That is uh, an effort uh, replicating an army field generator from an exercise bike. So, microwave kilns. Very curious thing, aren't they? I mean, a normal kiln is basically a big oven. There's lots of insulation and lots of electric heating elements or gas heating where you can raise the temperature up really high to do some kind of process. I mean, normally it's firing pottery or tiles or bricks, although there are specialised kilns that do things like make cement. But in essence, they're just a box where you can get a temperature hot enough to do something. Microwave kilns came along mostly because of glass fusing and low temperature ceramics because they can only really get up to about eight or nine hundred degrees centigrade. I mean, I say only, that's still pretty lethal as a temperature. But that, in essence, is what they are. There's something you can stick in your microwave that will heat up to a very hot temperature to do something. Now the microwave kiln, I would say it was humble, but a revolutionary invention that traces its roots to the latter half of the 20th century. It was developed as an accessible alternative to traditional kilns, because traditional kilns are traditionally big and expensive to run. But the microwave kiln, well, it's much smaller and much more convenient, and the idea was to, to democratise the art of glass fusing and ceramics. And low temperature ceramics and glass are where the microwave kiln really lives. Indeed, it was originally conceived as a solution for hobbyists and artisans who were seeking a compact and user-friendly means of doing glass work in their kitchen. Now, these kilns did undergo a series of evolutionary phases from a rudimentary design to much more sophisticated iterations, and they evolved into portable refractory line containers capable of withstanding the heat generated within a microwave. At its core, a microwave kiln comprises a refractory material arranged within a compact enclosure. 
The refractory lining, which is mostly ceramics and insulating materials, allows the kiln to endure the intense heat produced by the microwave without damage. That core is painted on the inside with something called a susceptor material. It's the susceptor material that gets hot, and usually it's carbon-based. It absorbs the microwaves and then gets really hot and gives that heat back out to the centre of the kiln, where the workpiece you're working on is located. The process is deceptively simple, but it does require precision. The intense heat produced by the susceptor material heat fuses the materials together, allowing an artisan to create intricate designs and forms. Control is crucial. Timing and temperature determine the outcome of the craft. Too little time and the materials don't fuse adequately, too much and they risk overheating, leading to deformities or melting. They're pretty versatile devices and they've been used across a whole range of things from jewellery making to glass fusing and pottery by hobbyists and educators alike and they offer a gateway for creative expression. In jewellery making the kiln enables artisans to fuse glass pieces into stunning pendants, earrings or decorative elements and the controlled heat process allows for intricate design and vibrant colour com combinations. In glass fusing these kilns facilitate the merging of glass layers, creating bowls and plates and sculptures, and artists manipulate the heating time and temperature to achieve the desired shapes and textures, and that unleashes a spectrum of possibilities. Pottery enthusiasts find these kilns ideal for small-scale projects, enabling the firing of clay and glazers to produce miniature ceramic pieces or test pieces or try out new designs before large-scale execution. Despite its accessibility and creative potential, the microwave kiln isn't without challenges. Achieving precise temperatures and mastering the nuances of heating remain ongoing endeavours for artists working with these kilns. Controlling heat distribution within the small confines of a microwave sized space requires a degree of finesse. Over time, advancements in refractory materials and the development of more sophisticated designs have aimed to address these challenges. Innovations in kiln construction and materials continue to refine the art of microwave based glasswork and ceramics. Personally, I think the microwave kiln is a testament to human ingenuity. People wanted to do something, traditional ways of doing it were too cumbersome and expensive, so they found a new way. From its humble beginnings to the present day, this little device can best be described as empowering. Now the secret to any microwave kiln is the susceptor. It's that grey stuff that's painted on the inside of the kiln body. It, remember, absorbs the microwaves and gives the energy back out as heat. So susceptor converts microwaves to heat. One of the best susceptor materials there are? Well, it's graphite. So this, which is um, Rustin's G-Shield, I'm not recommending it, it's just that I happen to have this, is a graphite graphene paint that will act as a susceptor brilliantly. In fact, any of these materials will. Any of these EMF smog-based um, paints that have graphite in them are going to do that job. Now, it's only going to work temporarily. But we're only going to make a temporary kiln and we're going to paint it onto a plant pot. It only works temporarily because the binders in here will burn away. So after a few uses, you'll have to repaint it. But if you were to mix graphite with something like water glass, then you would have a permanent paint that would act as a susceptor. We're going to use this for our demonstration. So we're going to use this thing. It's a flower pot. It cost me about 50p and I'm going to make it out of this. Now it's not the best material to make it out of because this clay will stand about five or six hundred degrees centigrade and the kiln gets up above and beyond that. But it's still good enough if what you want to do is give this a go to see if you actually want to try the craft. If you like it and you want to make a better version then obviously you can use a better clay. So something like a stoneware cup for instance, will do a much better job. Uh, something like a porcelain cup or porcelain bowl, that'll do an even better job. Stoneware lasts to about 800 and porcelain's going to last to about 1200 degrees C. So those materials are going to last much, much longer. This one, really cheap, give you a few goes to see if you like the craft. Now, I'm not a uh, glass craftsman. I'm a chemist. So uh, my glass craft work, it's rubbish. But what you do is you take your surface, whether it's our plant pot or it's your cup or your porcelain, and all you actually do is paint a layer of the ink on the inside of whatever it is that you choose to paint. 
Now we've chosen this. You can use uh, aluminum brick, actually. If you use an aluminum brick, which you can buy on eBay, um, then you paint it with this ink, you will have yourself a microwave kiln that is in fact absolutely on a par with a commercial one. That's in fact what commercial kilns are. They're a bit of aluminum cast into the shape, the, uh, the round shape of the kiln, and painted with an ink very like ours. Only ours will do this job as well. So once we've given it a coat, and notice I've only coated that section of it, then you've got to leave it to dry. And give it a little bit of time to dry, and then it'll be ready to go. And that effectively is your microwave kiln. And now here's one I prepared earlier, so it's had a chance to dry. And if I pop that in the microwave, it will get hot. It'll get to about 600 degrees, but it'll lose that heat very, very quickly. So in order to fuse glass, you need to keep that heat in there, and we need some kind of insulation. The easiest insulation is this stuff, which is ceramic fibre blanket. You can see how deep that is, about as deep as the plant pot, so about 100 millimetres, and it's about half a metre long, and that's enough to go around my plant pot twice. Now, this stuff is amazingly insulating. So once I've wrapped that on my plant pot, and I want it to stay, then I can put something around there to keep that in place, like a bit of string. So, a bit of string more than enough to keep this stuff in place and the string isn't going to burn because of the insulation properties of the ceramic, uh, the ceramic blanket you've just wrapped it in. So tie yourself a bit of string around it and there you go one kiln. Now how <laughs> stupidly easy was that? So if you want to practice with this craft, to see this craft is for you that is going to be one of the easiest, cheapest ways of getting around to it to see if you like it. If you like it and you want to make a better version of this, or even buy a commercial version, but if you want to make a better version of this, then you'd want something like an aluminum silica brick, a fire brick. It's that lightweight fire brick. Drill it out so that you get your cavity on the inside, and then you need to paint the cavity with a bit of ink, a bit of susceptor ink. Once you've done that, that's your kiln finished. However, with our practice kiln... What we've got in here is our glass tray and another square of ceramic blanket, because this gets really hot, remember. Two bits of glass that we're going to fuse together, pop our kiln on there, and stick the whole thing back in the microwave. Now, obviously, you need to make sure that your plant pot will go in the microwave. Otherwise, you're in trouble, because it won't turn. And I don't know if you noticed, but the microwave, uh, the plant pot rather, has a hole in it. You need a vent hole. So if you choose something like stoneware or porcelain, you're going to have to drill that vent hole, but a tile drill will do that just fine. Set that on for about three or four minutes, and leave it to spin. Now, when you look in there, what you'll see is a red-hot glow out of this. So when this is done and it pings, then leave it for half an hour to cool down naturally. And once you've left it for half an hour to cool down naturally, again in good blue Peter tradition, Here's a bit that I fused earlier, and you can see the two layers of glass, and they've fused beautifully into each other. So in order to make the cheapest possible microwave kiln, plant pot, our ink, some ceramic blanket. You want to make a super duper one, get some aluminium, uh, aluminum, aluminium oxide block, carve out a shallow hole, paint the inside with some ink, and put it on a tray, and you've got yourself a microwave kiln to practice this uh, glass fusing craft. The Oxford Bell. The Oxford Bell is a non-stop ringing bell that's been ringing since 1840 and it's at Oxford University at the Clarendon Laboratory. It was made by Watkin and Hill, London-based instrument makers, and it was purchased by the Reverend Robert Walker, an experimental philosophy reader. He's actually got a note there that says set up in 1840 and that note still stands. The setting up was verified by his grandson and a photograph was taken and it has rung ever since. Despite its perpetual ringing, the bell's actually nearly inaudible. The inner workings are clearly visible through the glass dome, and it consists of a small metal clapper, which is likely brass, and that hangs suspended by a thin silk fibre between two vertical pillars, which are dry piles linked in series. The clapper's pear-shaped because it's worn slightly on one side from striking the bell's edge. On the opposite side, it remains unmarked as it strikes above the lower set edge of the bell. Between the bell's brass terminals at the base of the pillars, the voltage measures around 2 kilovolts, and the clapper draws about 1 nanoamp while oscillating roughly at 2 hertz. 
twice the expected rate under gravity alone. The oscillations actually vary with weather conditions and slow down in humid weather and occasionally cease due to increased humidity. However, they resume automatically without anybody having to give them a little push. There have been times when the bell was deliberately stopped, but that was mostly due to having to relocate it. The exact composition of the piles is actually unknown, but it's evident that they have an outer layer of sulphur, and that seals the cell and possibly an electrolyte. Similar piles were created by Zamboni and Duluc, and are quite famous consisting mostly of 2,000 pairs of tinfoil discs adhered to zinc sulphur impregnated paper coated on the other side with manganese dioxide. Notable other contributors in the field of dry piles include Jean de Luc, a fellow of the Royal Society, credited as a pioneer in the field, along with the works of people like Méchon, Beran and Zamboni as previously mentioned. Interest was not always confined to inorganic substances and metals and there are accounts of the performance of piles made from slices such as wood, beetroot, radish, all kinds of things. The conviction was that a natural process was involved and this might have led to the use of manganese dioxide which in itself is pretty impressive as a substance which releases oxygen on heating. Zamboni certainly included manganese dioxide in his recipe the dry piles weren't limited to electric bells, they also powered pendulum clocks, and publications from the early 19th century by Ronald and Zamboni detail their applications in other methods. During World War II, the Oxford dry pile played an unexpected role in scientific history as a portable battery. The Admiralty Research Laboratory were working with an infrared telescope using an image converter tube with a lead sulphide cathode, and this was later replaced by lead telluride, but it called for a portable battery of about 3 kilovolts at a very low current. Dr A. Elliot, an Oxford physicist, remembered the dry pile in the Clarendon Laboratory and followed a recipe given by Charles E. Benham in The English Mechanic, February to March 1915, and made quite a few of them that saw military use all the way through the Second World War. They were also used in electrostatic voltmeters and night vision scopes. The Oxford dry pile is still working and shows no signs of exhausting its energy. In fact, it seems more likely that the clapper will wear out before the energy stores are depleted. The exact method of operation is under debate. On whether it's an electrostatic device, so it works just by contact of two dissimilar materials exchanging electrons, or it works just like any other battery via a chemical reaction. And it is an important difference because if it's electrostatic, then of course it is a perpetual device. It will, for all intents and purposes, just last forever. If it's like a normal battery, of course, it's going to last until the reactants run out. Now, somebody did point out that given that the thing has been running for about 170 years or so, and it's about one nanoamp of energy, it takes about one microgram of the reactants to provide that energy. And so, of course, it's got a while to go. Somebody else, however, pointed out that if you get moisture in these batteries to form like electrolyte, it does in fact kill them. So there is a huge debate with stuff at stake as to how this thing actually works. It's actually really, really easy to make. Now essentially it's two materials in contact with each other. Now if you put any two materials in contact with each other at the point at which they touch, they will in fact transfer electrons. Now obviously some materials are better at this than others and the traditional one uses zinc and manganese dioxide. So you have a layer of zinc foil, a layer of a separator, usually paper, and a layer of manganese dioxide. You slap them all together and you get a pretty good Zamboni pile. Now, we don't have any zinc foil or manganese dioxide, so I'm going to make it with stuff that I have available. And here it is. This is just aluminium foil. It's roofing foil. It's really easy to get hold of. You just go down to the builder's merchant and you'll see it sitting on the shelf and just buy yourself a roll. So you attach your foil, flip your paper over. Now I'm going to use my uh, ordinary conductive ink. This is just the non-waterproof stuff. And all you do is paint a layer. So when it's dry, you'll have a bit of paper with some zinc foil on one side and some conductive ink on the other side. And all you have to do then is cut it out. Once you cut it out, you'll get that. Then all you have to do is cut it into roughly 25mm squares. And there we go. 
If you want a more impressive pile, you need to make a couple of thousand of these. Put them together in one big pile, add an aluminium contact plate and wrap them up with some sellotape. So that is a 100 nanofarad capacitor with an LED light. We wait a few seconds and you should charge the capacitor. Then we can do it again. And again. I forgot to mention that a good source of the carbon might be that, which is the electrosmog paint that we keep going on about. It's a graphite paint that's supposed to contain graphene, but it would be a good carbon to use in a device like that, because it is an intriguing device. I mean, it's um, easy to make, but it is a little fiddly. But still, lots of interesting things might be able to be done with something like that. Somewhat obviously, this is a petrol-driven generator, and I bought it a few years ago because of the fuel crisis, and it basically sits around for absolutely ages because it gets used every sort of two years or so, and of course, that creates a bit of an issue because petrol these days is actually a mixture of petrol and ethanol and emulsifier to make sure it all mixes, and after three or six months or so, it separates out and the petrol's unusable, so you have to keep rotating it if this is going to be any use whatsoever, and that's a pain in the neck. But there is a fuel that has a virtual forever lifespan, and that's in your barbecue. It's um, propane or butane or a mix. That will last as long as the cylinder lasts without you having to change it. So it's a really cool fuel to be able to use in something like this, which is an emergency generator. And of course, they are considered a clean burn in the same way that ethanol is, whereas petrol, of course, is considered a dirty burn. And the conversion of these is a huge misnomer, actually, because the conversion is just ridiculously simple. I mean, you can buy kits, but the kits amount to metal plates with little spigots on them where you can put the hoses without them dropping off. But right here, is the air filter. And if I remove the air filter, we have a sponge, take that away, and there is the actual carburetor. Now if I take my gas hose and just dangle it there and sellotape it on here, turn over the engine, the engine vacuum will pull the gas into the engine and the engine will run just jim dandy. I mean, there's a difference in the air to fuel ratio that you have to introduce, but you can fiddle on with that by twisting the valve until you get the right ratio and it runs the engine beautifully. There are lots of videos on this on YouTube on how to do these conversions. And the simplest one, as I say, is dangle the hose right there and sellotape it on. Although you can buy various kits to do it. So this is from a regular barbecue. It's got the regulator on one side and two gas rings on the other. When you turn the gas on, you'll have gas coming out of these two ring ports attached to rubber hoses and then position them over the air intake of the carburetor. So the setup of this, there's the propane tank with its regulator, there's the setup that came off the grill leading into the carburetor, and those are the original gas knobs that control the gas flow. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying do it like that. I'm saying it's as simple as doing that, which is why all petrol cars can be converted to LPG. And while the LPG conversion isn't that expensive, and if you're more comfortable with buying an online kit, buy an online kit, but it really is that simple to be able to convert a petrol-driven engine to a propane butane LPG engine. Of course, they're still being driven by something that you burn, so what is the advantage of it? Well, it produces more energy, it's a safer fuel, and it's more flexible to use. But of course, the bulk way that propane is made at the moment is from the liquid components recovered during natural gas processing. So it's essentially still a fossil fuel in that bag of horrible fossil fuels. And that was the state of affairs until the rise of biopropane. It's derived from biological sources rather than fossil fuels, and it shares identical properties with conventional propane. 
However, as a renewable fuel, biopropane significantly lowers carbon emissions compared to traditional propane derived from fossil fuels. Its production actually involves capturing carbon from the atmosphere and thereby contributing less to greenhouse gas emissions. The raw materials are things like agricultural waste and plant oils and organic matter, and of course they're renewable. It saw its rise in the late 20th century with efforts to convert biomass and such into gases. Advancements in biochemical engineering catalysts and process optimization have played a pivotal role in biopropane advancing. The production processes have been conventionally biomass conversion through pyrolysis and gasification or fermentation, hydrogenation of organic oils and fats to convert them into a propane, and waste conversion of organic waste materials. But in the last five years or so, there has been a new kid on the block, and that is algae. Algae are absolutely everywhere and the defined as a group of photosynthetic organisms that lack true root stems and leaves so there's just a huge amount of them with an enormous range of properties and possibilities another source of biopropane arising is the use of bacteria scientists in finland have used escherichia coli to produce propane at commercial levels so as we've seen propane and therefore biopropane is what's called a drop in fuel we don't have to change anything we can continue using all the machinery we've got just with propane as the fuel the issue has been the source of the propane it's either come from cracking gases or it's come from foodstuffs but with the advent of algae and bacteria as being the methodology for propane production that issue really goes away it's one of the reasons i don't particularly worry about these things because we have so many valuable and viable technologies and ideas that people are working on all of the time to be able to overcome the issues that we think we've got. It's just we're not as aware of them as perhaps we should be. And those algae and bacteria produced fuels that can be used straight as is in the machinery that we've got represent to me a huge opportunity. Have you ever thought about these? They're so-called floating tables and they work on a principle called tensegrity. Now the idea of tensegrity has been around for absolutely ages. There is an argument that traditional kayaks and shoji from Japanese housing use this idea of tensegrity. But it really came to the forefront, I would suppose, in a 1920s Russian art movement that developed across the world and could be argued to have reached its peak with Kenneth Snelson in 1948 and his famous Needle Tower sculpture put up in 1960. And it was in the 60s that Buckminster Fuller coined the term tensegrity. And it's been with us ever since. Finding applications in architecture, like in the 1988 Summer Olympics, it was used in the uh, roof of the main stadium, and in 2009 a bridge was put up in Australia called the Kurilpa Bridge, and then in 2014 NASA created something that they call their Super Ball Bot, which is... <laughs> interesting name and there's also an argument there exists something called biotensegrity where muscle and skeletal structures and cell membranes are held together by the same principles compression and tension compression is when you try to squeeze something together and of course things like tubes are brilliant if you try to squeeze them together which is why wood is so good, because wood is basically lots of tubes all packed together. Tension is when you pull something apart. What's really good on that is bits of string and wire. If you pull them, they're very strong, because if we push them, they've got no compression at all. They just fold up. Tensegrity is the arrangement of things, so they only have compression, where they're good at compression, and tension when they're good at tension. Because there's also another force, obviously. If I'm compressing something and I put a force in that direction, it's called shear. And of course, things that are good in compression aren't that good in shear. So for a floating table, we have a support structure attached to the table top. And that's hung with this cable from a bottom support structure. The table top and the top support structure tries to fall downward because of gravity and that creates tension in this cable and prevents it from falling downward. 
The Crosser tabletop isn't very stable with this arrangement, which means more support cables with proper tension are needed in order to make it stable. So this cable at the back prevents the tabletop from tilting forwards. And in the same way, with the minimum of three, that is two more cables, it's possible to block all motions of the tabletop. The centre cable prevents it from dropping down, and we get a stable structure with the tabletop suspended in midair. Now to make one of these, you need a structure like this, and you basically print off two of those, and here they are. Now that one forms the bottom structure, and that one goes there with the two cups underneath each other, because these two discs are where you tie the bit of string. So this top bit falls down, and we get our string in tension. Add three more strings around it, and hey presto, you've got your floating table. And of course you can make these in any shape you like, as long as you've got these two points one above the other. You don't only need to use a little bit of string, you can achieve the same effect with magnets. So in that little recess I've put one of these magnets and it's 4mm uh, by 15mm north-south on the top and bottom face and I've also attached some very fine copper wires to the three slots. And that one I've done exactly the same but these magnets are actually attractive so they hold that way. What we need to do is stick something in between those that will stop them going all the way together. So I've got a couple of washers and a plastic spacer. We put those together and that will give us the height. Now if it won't quite stick like this one won't because the magnets aren't strong enough, well add some extra magnets so that you get it to stick. When it's holding together, then we can take these copper wires and line them up with the three slots we've got in the top section and fasten them down. Okay, if you're thinking about doing this, I can tell you, doing it with the magnet is a huge fiddle on, but when you get it to work, I mean, it's really worth it because it does look like it's floating there, which is pretty cool. Now then, why do I say this is a generator? Well, it's being investigated as the possibility of being a generator. The way tensegrity structures are being used actually boggles the mind from the very structure itself because it's self-erecting, it can collapse down into nothing and the structure is incredibly robust and adaptive to changing conditions and so it's finding its use in things like wind turbines, equally in wave machines where you can put the structure in the sea and use the structure itself. It's also being used in adaptive solar cells on the sides of buildings and when you think about the tensegrity structure, then you can look at the very elements of it, that is the rods or the ropes, to turn those into energy scavengers where the stretching can be used to harvest tribal electricity or to use a linear generator. So it's again mind-boggling, it's far greater than a floating coffee table as an amusing parlour trick to something that really is Quite interesting and quite astounding. The water motors are one of those examples in technology that look like a forgotten technology, but far from it. Water motors are built in industry today with abilities in the sort of 8 to 15 kilowatt range of generation. It's not that they've forgotten, it's more that we're not really aware, because you find them in all kinds of places that are relatively surprising, like fire alarms, for instance, and they're still being made. Their history goes back to the late 1800s and the Pelton wheel, because most of them were, in fact, Pelton wheels in our housing, and they found a huge range of applications, from things like sewing machines right the way through to both domestic and industrial fans, and even weird things like food mixers and washing machines and potato peelers, right the way through to home generation units, and even Meccano produced a range of water motors for the Meccano sets. All based on the Pelton wheel. Now the turbo turbine we've talked about before, and that is kind of a development of the Pelton wheel, and it's very efficient. So an idea of running a turbo turbine as a water motor, I would think would be tremendously interesting. So I turned to Tinkercad and drew this up. 
Now, you've got to remember this is a work in progress, but I will put this on Thingiverse should anybody actually want to join in and use these parts. So the heart of this device is pretty straightforward. It's really these five bits. Of course, we've got the turbine, which is right there, and it goes into the housing, which is made out of this bit, the turbine slotting in there, and then the housing top, and there's a foot there as a drain that lines up with those three holes there. So all we've got to do really is put some bearings in here, a piece of 8mm rod down there, and glue it to the foot, and that's all we really need to do. Now these are uh, 6 or 8 bearings, so they're uh, 7mm deep, 8mm centre, 22mm wide, and they take an 8mm piece of bar. So I'm going to stuff some bearings in there. There we go. One. Two, and two in here, and glue the foot on and put that in. Okay, like that. Now you might notice there's an 8mm washer there. And that's a standard thing for me to put an 8mm washer in, because when we press something together, that will press against the inner edge of that bearing there, and it won't lock against this here and allow it to spin freely, because all we do now is making sure this is pointing upwards, put that on there. And in there you'll see three little holes, two millimetres across, pointing at 30 degrees into that section there. So the water gets fed in here, squeezes out through there, and jets over in that direction on the turgo. So let's put that on. Now we add that bit onto there, because that's the bit that takes the hose attachment. And this is free to turn. Here we go. One thing I forgot to point out was the draft excluder. You'll see around here there's a white draft excluder. You can get it white or brown. And it's this D-shaped draft excluder. You just pull off the backing and stick it down all the way around, and it'll form a water seal so we don't get too much water uh, coming out. It's incredibly cheap, and it's well worth doing. So we just put a bit of that draft excluder. Then we put the cover on. And then when I've got here, and these are in the file actually, a little C-clamp, so they just go over there, tighten down to hold the cover in place, and there's four of them. Okay, and that's it together. Now all we've got to do is test it, and that means putting a hose on there. Now any water wheel is going to work if you point some water at it, so we point the hose without the top on, of course it's going to spin. But this is the difference it makes when we change that to pressure. If I put my finger over it and create a bit of pressure, the volume of water has changed, the pressure has gone up, and look how crazily it spins. And that is the benefit of a thing like a Pelton wheel, or in this case a turbo turbine. Now the turbine operates best apparently when that water jet is somewhere between 25 and 30 degrees. So these are the holes in the lid and they're set at 30 degrees. Mm -mm. They seem a bit weedy to me, so this is the first effort. We'll put it together and see what happens. And if we put the wheel on, we can see it does spin it, although perhaps not as well as the other one did. Oh. Okay, so for me, that was a learning experience. That bit, I thought, worked really well, actually. The water didn't clog up, it drained out nicely, because I was worried that this would be too big. We get splashed back, and we get clogging, and all sorts of things. But that worked, bit, I think, worked really nicely, although maybe we do want to shrink that down a bit. I still thought that worked nicely. This bit, I'm a little bit more um and ah about. I put in three holes there that are two millimeters diameter, and I don't think the water came out with a lot of force, particularly when you compared it to just putting my thumb on the end of the pipe. So I'm thinking that these holes aren't a good idea. What we could look at is maybe a slot and take it down to one millimeter. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching, and I'm going to pursue this a little bit more because I certainly think it's interesting. But perhaps not as interesting as the fact that you can just buy these if you want. Anyway, thanks again.